Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? Hi, Al. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a yep. pleasure to interview you. I don't want to lay it on thick, but Tim Flannery is one of the great science heroes of this planet. I've learned so much from your books and from your research, Tim, and you didn't expect this, but I want to give a plug for your latest book, Atmosphere of Hope, Searching for Solutions to the Climate Crisis. And in this latest book, you propose a new way forward with clean technologies. Um, and could you tell us just a little bit about your ideas and carbon negative technology? Sure, Al. Um, I think we've got to the point now where we can't really keep the world safe from runaway climate change without contemplating pulling uh, some of the CO2 out of the air. And that's a big task. Uh, but it turns out that it is possible. You know, one way we could do this at scale is by uh, seaweed farming, ocean open seaweed, uh, ocean open ocean seaweed farming. Uh, you know, kelp grows at about 30 to 60 times the rate of land-based plants, and it sucks in lots of carbon as it grows. So, if we could have oceanic seaweed farms, uh, which would be feeding people with high-quality protein, fish and oysters and so forth, at the same time we're pulling CO2 out of the air and sequestering it in a deep ocean. Uh, we'd potentially have a solution that's scalable, that could really make a difference. So that's just one option among the many that are available to us. Yeah, I've been pleased to join with you and uh, the great Jim Hansen as uh, part of the jury for Richard B Branson's uh, big prize for somebody that can figure out how to do this uh, cost effectively. But I was doing the math yesterday, Tim. The current estimate, maybe I have this wrong, but with current approaches, they estimate maybe $600 per ton to remove it. Well, today we put up 110 million tons, so that's another $60 billion for today's extra emissions. So as we work on these potentially exciting ways of removing it, we got to stop putting so much up there. I know you agree, but uh, go ahead. No, that's absolutely clear, Al. And, and that figure that you gave on average for pulling CO2 out of the air, it sounds about right to me. And it, it should really act as a bit of a benchmark for how much we charge to put carbon into the atmosphere in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We do need to put that brake on existing emissions as hard and fast as possible. Because the job of getting CO2 out of the atmosphere, as you know, as one of the Virgin Earth Challenge judges, is formidable. The only point that I'd make is that if we want to have these technologies scalable and cost effective over time, we need to start the innovation and investment process now. We're a bit in the position that, say, wind energy was or solar energy was in the 1970s, you know, when those sources of energy were many hundreds of times more expensive than conventional electricity. So we have to go from that $600 a tonne down to $60 or $6 a tonne yeah. in 30 or 40 years' time, or maybe even profit making. If we can do that, I think we can make it. But boy, you'd have to say the challenge is enormous as we face it at the moment. Yeah, and uh, the sooner we get started, the better. And putting a price on carbon would help us use market forces to help us uh, get this done. But it's also important to inform the public. And one of the many reasons I admire your work, Tim, is that in addition to doing world-class research uh, and communicating through your books, to the public. You set up the Climate Council in Australia for the specific purpose of providing an independent source of the best evidence available in the scientific community to inform the public. How's that going? Look, we're doing very well, thank you, Al. Um, that process really developed out of me and my fellow commissioners being sacked by a right-wing government in 2013. Yeah. Uh, we, we understood that what we were doing in terms of providing information people could understand was valuable to the Australian public. But, you know, a week after I was sacked, we, we decided to crowdfund the, um, the commission effectively back into existence as the Climate Council to keep doing that work. And I was blown away by yeah. the support we got. I mean, today, three years later, we're three times bigger than we were in government. Wow. And we're more effective. Uh, so it just shows you people really care about this, Al, as you know. Um, and, and it's a privilege for me to serve on that Climate Council, you know, to provide Australian 
the Australian public with the information that they need to make wise decisions. And we know it's having an impact. We see year after year more people understand the situation and are willing to act. So uh, I, I don't see a shortcut to educating people. I think, sadly, that's the process we have to go through in this country. We will get to the tipping point soon, Alan, I can assure you of that, where we will have a carbon price in this country and we will start reducing emissions. Uh, we're just not there yet. We're in a position where we've just got to push as hard as we can this year and for the next few till we get there. Yeah, um, and that's great. Um, you were awarded, as uh, Sarah said, uh, in 2007, uh, Australian of the Year for your work on this. Um, I'm interested in your view on why political reform has been so slow to, to take hold. And with the incredible drop in the price of electricity from solar and wind, and with the incredible solar and wind resources that Australia has, is it just the power of the coal industry in influencing politicians to drag them back into the past and try to block the future? Is that too simplistic or is that really happening? Uh, that's really happening, Al. Um, you know, the coal industry has been with Australia virtually since the birth of the nation, you know, right. 200 years ago. Uh, it, it's a very powerful industry. A few years back, Australia was really the Saudi Arabia of the coal export trade. We were um, really dominating in the amount of coal that we were exporting and still a very powerful business. Um, today, things have changed a little bit. You know, almost all of the new uh, energy generation technology that's being deployed in Australia is renewable. But the problem we face is that there are large numbers of very old, very inefficient uh, coal-fired power plants. They're, they're pithead plants using lignite, so they're very cheap to run. And uh, the industry is defending really their right to run them into the ground. And, and that's where the problem is. We really need to retire those old plants uh, in the next few years in order to create space for the new investments in, in clean tech, in wind and solar and concentrator solar and so forth. Uh, but the, the coal industry is still holding us back. They still do exert a very big influence on government. Yeah, and another thing that Australia has in common with the U.S. is uh, you have a, a climate denier movement that's still uh, rattling uh, around there, uh, supported by some news media organizations uh, that are all too similar to a few that we have in the U.S. that, uh, you know, there's been this recent controversy about so-called fake news but actually fake news on climate's been around for quite a while and you have it in Australia, right? Well, that's right. That's what I keep telling my friends in the wake of this controversy. Uh, the, I've been suffering from it and many of us have for years, that fake news. Uh, and probably, you know, some of the people that own some of the media here in Australia that keep on pushing that denialist line are the same people that own some of the US media too. You can take the maybe uh, out of that sentence. But you know, we live in a changing world. <laughs> I was trying to be polite, Al. Uh, I'm I am too, but You're quite you know, right. it is what it uh, is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, very sadly. Uh, but, you know, the media landscape is changing. The sort of the work that the Climate Council does, for example, you know, we get our, our report shared very, very widely now by, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. We get millions of readers, ultimately, of this stuff. And the that, that monopoly that the that the print media particularly and the television uh, had so strongly a decade ago is breaking down and one of my great hopes is that we are able to get the message through particularly to younger people who engage more yeah. with social media yeah. uh, than perhaps with the traditional media yeah we're seeing the same thing here in the u.s uh, the voting patterns and the opinions on climate are very different in the millennial generation and, you know, Mother Nature is way more persuasive than even the Climate Council because the extreme weather events and the climate-related threats to Australia are, are really affecting the way people think. Same here in the U.S. And I, I said uh, in the uh, short slideshow at the beginning of this segment that Australia is one of the most vulnerable countries. Actually, I should amend that because countries like Bangladesh and the low-lying uh, Pacific Island nations are, are clearly more vulnerable. But among the advanced, developed countries, Australia is probably the most 
vulnerable, developed country because of your uh, geographic place in the Southern Ocean and your, the fact that you're the driest uh, of, the, of the continents, what other factors uh, make Australia uniquely vulnerable to the climate crisis? Well, Al, one of them surely has to be our unique biodiversity, which is very ancient and often very fragile and tied to a very narrow range of uh, possible climates. Uh, the great example of that is Australia's Great Barrier Reef, yeah. uh, you know, an area the size of Germany and one of the most pristine and beautiful environments or hitherto pristine environments you'll ever see. Uh, I first dived on the reef uh, as a teenager 40 years ago before the first bleaching event was ever recorded. And I can tell you how extraordinarily beautiful it was and how rich it was. Uh, you know, as I speak now, something like 70% of that reef is dead. Mm. And 20% and of that, a, a big hunk, uh, died just earlier this year in this wow. unprecedented heat wave that slammed into the barrier and just killed coral right across the northern section. Uh, you know, I, I, I struggle. I lay awake at night uh, wondering how we can marshal the action that's required to save the Great Barrier Reef. It, it is very vulnerable to climate change. And it's just one habitat here in Australia. You know, our famous wetlands in northern Australia, such as Kakadu, are probably equally vulnerable. Yeah. Um, some of our southern uh, wet rainforests are also vulnerable. The, the, the tropics and deserts are expanding southwards and having a big impact on those isolated habitats with their biodiversity that's tens of millions of years old. Yeah. So for me as a scientist, as a, a biologist originally, I worry as much about other animals as about humans. Yeah, the biologists, uh, almost to a person, will say the loss of biodiversity is actually the, the number one uh, damage uh, uh, symptom of the climate crisis. Well, Tim, we've run out of time, uh, but it's a real privilege uh, to have you take part in 24 Hours of Reality. I want to give a shout out to all of the Australian climate leaders. You've been with us there and helping to educate us. I've learned so much uh, from you. I want to acknowledge that uh, debt. Keep up your great work, and thank you again for joining us uh, this year on 24 Hours of Reality. Thank you very much, Alan, and best wishes for your country into the future as you tackle this issue. Thank you.